is not going to be a video about homelessness, addiction, and poverty. I'm not going to ask you to volunteer at Charlotte Rescue Mission. I'm not even going to ask you to make a donation to Charlotte Rescue Mission. But what I want to do is take you behind the scenes of what God is doing in the hearts and lives of the people that we serve. And can I also add, what do you want to do in your heart, which is why you're watching this video? Think about this. God loves us. And because of that, the ground at the cross is very level. You know, my story is different from the people that I serve. It's messy, it's ugly, but it's just different. And in spite of that, God loves me, not for what I have done, but for what He has done on the cross and welcomes me into His family. We have a choice in life. We can either keep family secrets and stay sick or break family secrets and get healthy. And when we break the family secrets, when we talk about the brokenness in our life, we talk about all the things that have happened to us that maybe have been outside of our control, they lose their power over us. And so when you come alongside us and you become a part of the ministry of Charlotte Rescue Mission, you know, it's not something that you post on Instagram. It's not about a picture on Facebook. It's not an event. It's a process of restoration. It's about, it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you in the hearts and lives of the people that he brought to Charlotte Rescue Mission. To qualify for Charlotte Rescue Mission, you have to have an addiction to drugs and alcohol. But I've learned over the years that addictions are more than just alcohol and drugs. There are things like work and food and sex and gambling and religion and spending and rage. And all those things are things that people use to alleviate the pain in their soul. And unless we work from the inside out to address that root cause, what we call shame, nothing's gonna change in that person's life. And just like the residents of the Charlotte Rescue Mission, I have to bring my addiction to work and food every day to the foot of the cross for God to redeem me. And we don't expect you to come down to the Rescue Mission and understand all the nuances of addiction. They're multifaceted. But we want you to know this, that while you can't change their past, you can help them live today and help them achieve their God-given potential in the future. And that will be life-changing for them. But let me also say, it'll be life-changing for you. Well, good morning. My name's Jason, I'm one of the pastors around here, and that video reminds me of a couple of things that are just so important for what it means to be a part of Forest Hill Church. It reminds me of what we're actually about and how we do it and why, you know? Like, this is about more than just what happens on a weekend service, more than just what happens when we're gathered here. We are about, and if you are a part of Forest Hill, or if you are thinking about being a part of this, the church is about seeing that kind of transformation and hope take place outside these walls and inside these walls, right? The addictions that, that happen and are treated at Charlotte Rescue Mission and the ones that are right here in these seats too. Because some of us have them, as well. we all have them actually, right? It just depends on what our particular flavor is. So we're about seeing Jesus change and bring hope to people. And that's, that's amazing. And one of the things that I love about that is it shows how we're able to do that as a church is because our elders and leaders have created space in our budget space in our planning to be able to address needs like that when they come up. So you may not know this, but this year we have given away 19% of all of this, the money that comes in to force. So we just choose to take that and set it aside and use that for outside parties that need it. That is an amazing thing. So Charlotte Rescue Mission gets funded because of your generosity. And, then, and stuff like when a hurricane hits the Bahamas, we're able to respond because we have space. And the reason that we do it is because that's how God is. He is all about creating space to respond to us when we need it. We're starting this series about margin, where we're looking at how to find the space that I think every single one of us needs in our lives. And I wanna make you this commitment up front. If you will, over the next four weeks, if you will put into practice with intentionality, seriously put into practice what we're gonna talk about, I think this could be the best year that you have ever had. Because how many of us, it's September, we're back into the rhythm of school and life and it almost feels like the beginning of a new year. How many of you are already overwhelmed? Like kids, uh, thank you for being honest. Like some of you actually raised your hands. I did not expect that. 
Some of us are already in the middle of this. We are overwhelmed because we are so packed. We don't have any space, no margin. And every year we do the same thing. We get to September and we, we think about all these plans and the things that we want to do differently. And then we don't. And then our New Year's resolutions are about how to do things differently. And then they last for a week. And then we start over, right? Jessica and I, my wife, uh, every year around fall, we take a trip and, or we get away for a, a few days. And we try to plan like what the next year is going to be like. We talk about what kind of parents we want to be, what kind of friends we want to be, what kind of employees, neighbors, all that. And uh, last year we were away on this trip and we had some amazing plans. I mean, I'm telling you, like we came up with some stuff like cancer would probably get cured. I mean, all kinds of things. We were ready to roll. And we come, uh, we're coming back from our trip and literally in the middle of talking about, we're excited and both of us look at each other and we're like, who are we kidding? We don't have space for any of that. We can't do anything. I, I'm barely holding on to the life that we have planned right now. We're not curing cancer. And, and that has been for many of us, the, the rhythm of our life. It's about survival, isn't it? We just do our best to get through what's next. And I want to tell you that that is not the way life has to be. There is a better way to live than that. The way to live is by living with margin. And so in this series, I want us to use this definition to kind of help us stay focused on what we're talking about. Uh, there's a great definition, very memorable, very simple that I want to give you to write down on your note sheet. You'll see that even the way we're doing the handouts now for this series is, is designed to give you space and margin to respond to whatever God may say to you even during these messages. So there's not big outlines, there's, there's space. There's room for you to decide how to engage with and interact. And I want you to use that as well. On the back side, there's a little QRF code. Is that the right way to say that? QRF, QFR, you know, the thing you take a picture of that's on the back. And it says Engage FHC app. If you will use that, that is a tool we're going to give you to help you be able to find margin and create space in your life during this series. So here's the definition of margin I want us to use. It's by a guy named Richard Swenson who wrote a book called Margin. And Richard Swenson says that margin is this. It's the space between our load and our limits. The space between our load and our limits. By simply defining it that way, we're saying something about what it means to be human, aren't we? What it means to be human is that we have limits. Now, some of us don't believe that. Especially, you don't raise your hand, but all of my high schoolers in here, like ninth and 10th graders, you don't have to say, but right now you don't believe that you have a limit. You don't think that there's anything that can, you can do whatever you want to do. You have unlimited energy. You're never going to die. All that stuff. Like you feel it. And, and I'm so glad that you do because you're going to get a lot accomplished before you realize that it's not true. But the rest of us have come to the realization that we have limits. There's only so much we can do. We have psychological and emotional and physical and financial limits. And, and what we're trying to find is building in space between what we're carrying and what we're capable of. Because the truth is most of us believe especially in the West and, and even more, maybe like South Charlotte, we believe that the only life that's worth living is the one that's scheduled out and filled up to 120% capacity, don't we? I mean, actually, we may like this idea of a margin, but if you met somebody on the street tomorrow and they told you like, yeah, I kind of got my calendar working, I schedule out to about 80%. Don't lie, in your mind, you're like me, you're thinking like, they're lazy. And we might even get like super spiritual on a person and be like, you're supposed to use yourself up. You're supposed to skate into heaven with nothing left, completely burned out, burned up, all the way consumed. And I think Jesus would look at us in that moment and he would say, why? That was my job. See, what the life of following Jesus is about is finding space to prioritize and respond when God calls. Because some of us are so busy that we are missing opportunity day after day to not only have the kind of life that fills us with meaning and purpose, but can bring that to somebody else because we are too busy with our own stuff. It's, and some of it's good stuff. I was thinking of an illustration this week to try to show you visually, and I was thinking about how books are done. You know, when you write, any of you still read like regular paper books, not these things, but you know, stuff with pages? Yeah? So we lay out pages in a book like this. Great content on every page, I'm sure. But we leave space around the top sides and bottom, right? That's called margin. That's so that we can focus on this great content and be able to engage. What would you think would happen if every book that we wrote from here on out, we started laying out like this? I mean, doesn't that almost give you a panic attack? 
That is anxiety producing, just looking at that. And it may be more good stuff that you fit on the page, but you cannot handle all that good stuff. You need capacity. In his book, Richard Swinson said this. He said, we must have some room to breathe. We need freedom to think and permission to heal. Our relationships are being starved to death by velocity. No one has the time to listen, let alone love. Our children lay wounded on the ground, run over by our high speed, good intentions. Is God now pro-exhaustion, he asks. Doesn't he lead people beside still waters anymore? Who plundered those wide open spaces of the past? And how do we get them back? That's what this series is going to be about. Because here's the deal. We fill up and we leave no space because we can't say no. And I'll tell you a progression. We can't say no to the next promotion, the next opportunity. Uh, to, you know, when somebody asks you out on a date, you're afraid to say no because they might never ask you out again or no one will ever ask you out again. You don't say no to going to the party this weekend even though you know it puts you in conflict with what you know is best for you because you're afraid if you say no now, you'll never get asked again. You don't pass up a promotion even though this season in your life is not right for that because you're afraid it'll never come back around. See, we don't say no because of fear, but if we go one step deeper, the reason we're afraid, listen to this, the reason we're afraid is because we wrongly believe that we are ultimately in control and responsible for everything about our life. We want to believe that. We need to believe that in some ways. As humans, we think that if it is to be, it's up to me. And what I want to tell you, what I'm about to show you that Jesus would say is, you don't have to live that way. I'm not talking about not being a, a good steward or a hard worker. I don't mean that. But I mean, we say yes to everything because we believe if we don't, ultimately, we will feel that there's nobody else taking care of us and watching over. And I want to tell you that God is a God who wants to provide for us so that we can have space to be the humans that he intended us to be. So, the American Psychological Association last year put out this report. It talked about the level of anxiety. And this is a, a evidence of what I'm talking about being true. In the United States, over the last two years, the anxiety scale has gone up by five percentage points across the board. Okay, now that doesn't sound like a ton, except we started as the most anxious country in the, United, in the world. So we are just simply climbing a ladder towards overwhelm and burnout. And the anxiety is, even though millennials are like the most anxious generation that's ever been studied, probably because they keep being studied, <laughs> the highest increase of those experiencing anxiety was in the baby boomer generation. See, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your job is like or whether you have one. If you can push play or pause on this message, you need to create margin because anxiety is killing us. I was talking to a couple of teenagers last night after this Saturday night service. Uh, they're freshmen in high school and they were telling me about their schedule just this week. And they had a you know, JV football game on Thursday and then they had two baseball games yesterday and they've got two today and they came to church last night to squeeze in so they had homework. I mean, that, they're 14. Like this is, this is what's happening to us. So we're going to find space. There's a better way. It's the way of Jesus. It's the way of the kingdom. And the way that I want to introduce this to you is by reading you a very familiar piece of scripture. But I want you to listen and hear it differently. I want you to try to hear this passage through the lens of creating margin. It's found in Matthew 6. We're going to read verses 31 through 34. It's going to be on the screen. But I'd like to ask you out of reverence for the reading of the scripture if you'd stand. Here's how we're going to get margin. Jesus has been teaching the crowds and he's been talking to them about the fact that just like you and me, they're, they're anxious about stuff, about all kinds of things that people who don't follow him are anxious about too. People who believe that it's all up to them to make this stuff happen. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. 
Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is God's word. You guys can have a seat. When you read this, it looks like Jesus is, is building two categories for us. Two things about which we should spend our energy and our effort. One are things like food, water, and clothing. Fairly significant when it comes to being a human. Stuff that you need. Essentials of life. And on the other hand, he says, the other option is to prioritize something that he calls the kingdom of God. And, and if you look at that for a second, especially those of you who are not Jesus followers, I get it. You read that and you're like, golly, so out of touch. I mean, uh, is he saying that we shouldn't care about the essentials of life, like that food doesn't matter? And those of us who are being honest, for a second, we might think that too. But you know this about Jesus. He was actually a real person who walked the earth, who got hungry, who got thirsty, who got angry, who had moments of joy celebrating with his friends, things like weddings and parties, and who also got away in solitude to pray and to kind of reflect. I mean, he experienced everything that we experience. So Jesus is not trying to say that the only things that matter are spiritual activities. You know, your quiet time, your Bible reading and prayer. He's not saying that's all that matters. He's lived the same life that we've lived. What he's saying is the source of your and my anxiety is when we make those things and we take responsibility for those things as if we were God. That we put those first and then we figure out how to try to fit God in somewhere. You know what I mean? And, and the sad thing is for many of us who are followers of Jesus, that's how we live. Let me, let me tell you right now, um, this series is not about finding a way to squeeze a little extra Jesus into your already busy life. That's not what we're talking about. It's not about finding balance. This is a faith-fueled kingdom mindset of making God a priority that will give you the margin that you want and the fulfillment that you need. That's what this is about. Jesus says, when you prioritize my kingdom, I will take care of the rest. It's almost as if he says, if you take care of my business, I'll take care of yours. It's a pretty good trade. I mean, we don't actually believe him, but it's a pretty good trade. And he says, make it about the kingdom. Here's what the kingdom means. Um, Jesus often talked about that, and he would say things like, the kingdom has come near. Uh, Repent, for the kingdom is here now. This kingdom idea is, is uh, a real basic definition is this. The kingdom of God is any place or every place that the will of God is done. Ultimately, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we believe that one day he's going to return and he is going to set up as literal king over the whole universe, and everything is going to work the way it's supposed to. Until that day, he started with his arrival on earth, the kingdom beginning to break into our world. And it starts, you might get it from that definition, it starts not somewhere out there. It starts in here. The first place that we bring the kingdom and see it is in our hearts as we allow his will to be done in us. So we align ourselves to his priority. But it's, it's difficult for us to do sometimes. Because our needs are so in our face. And it's not just us. It's not just the people Jesus was talking to in the first century. The whole of human history, people have struggled with this idea of letting God be first. In fact, I want to show you this passage of scripture. It's in a, a book, a prophet called Haggai. Some people say, hey, guy, but I didn't want you to get like, you know, distracted by me saying, hey, guy, all the time. And anyway, now you are. But Haggai was a prophet who was speaking to the people after they came out of exile. And the story is this, the people of Israel have been through this pattern of trusting God and being free and finding his favor and then turning their back on him and going into slavery and then trusting and then getting delivered and, and just on and on and on. Ups and downs, swings of life, kind of like yours and mine. And the people have just exited exile, they're coming back home. And in those days, God had commanded the people to build a temple, but the temple had been destroyed by the last invaders. And the temple is where God brought them to worship. It's where his presence was most felt. It's almost as if that's where God lived, you know? And so he looks at the people and he says, when you come back home, prioritize my temple. Here's what Haggai says. After a few months, people haven't done a thing to God's house. And says, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. 
Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lives in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Basically, he says, think about how this is working for you. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. God says, How's your plan working out for you? You're, you're spending all your time and effort on your clothes and your food and your, your drink and your home and you're buying, you're making money and then it's like you put it in your pocket and there's a hole and it falls out the bottom. Like you're working so hard to try and take care of yourself and you just keep saying, God, you in a little while, we'll get to you. Now, you know, God doesn't need a house, right? This is not about a building that he needs. God wanted a home in the hearts of the people. He wanted them to prioritize him. And they keep saying, maybe like you have said in the past, where you just go like, yeah, I'll get to you in a little while, God. I, mean, I remember as a kid, like middle school age, you know, I was thinking like, I, I really I wanna follow Jesus and be a Christian kid, but, but not right now. I mean, it's middle school. I'll do that when I get to high school, you know? And then I got to high school and it was like, oh, Man, that's gonna be tough. Um, and you know what, I'll do that after, in college. That was stupid. All right. and, and then we get to college and then it's like, but I really gotta focus on me right now. Maybe after my first job, you only get one chance and then you do that and then it's when I get married. And when, I mean, we could push God off forever unless we intentionally decide to make him a priority. That's what Jesus was saying. Seek first my kingdom and I'll take care of the rest for you. Don't allow yourself to be anxious, believing that it's all on you. What's crazy about this to me is that Jesus basically says, I got you. I got you. You make me top priority and you don't need to worry about anything else. Now, the intellectually honest part of me says, and maybe you too, but that's not always true. Like you've seen, I've seen people who make God a part. It seems like they're always giving and making God first and things just don't work out for them. So which is it, Jesus? Are you actually gonna do what you said? Come through on your promise or, or is there something else going on here? And I'd say this, part of what it means to have everything given to us that we need is aligning our definition of enough with God's. Because what Jesus promised is, if you do this, I will make sure you always have enough. But sometimes me and God don't agree on what enough is. Right? I know this is starting to sting a little bit. It got me this week too, I was preparing. Don't worry, we're all in good company. But that's, that's the deal. He and I don't always agree on what's enough. In fact, we don't always agree on where it's gonna come from. And here's what's beautiful. The, the, the Charlotte Rescue Mission video reminds me, part of being in the community of faith, when we seek God's kingdom first, means you are with other people moving towards his kingdom, trying to bring it here, trying to prioritize that. When that happens, there are other people around that have, hopefully, margin that when you get in trouble, they can help. When I get in trouble, you can help. Part of God's plan all along was that his people would build into their lives space and margin to respond to the needs of others. So when somebody's caught in addiction, we're able to respond by helping them through Charlotte Rescue Mission and Dove's Nest and Rebound. Maybe when you're caught in a difficult spot, the church, the family of God around you are able to help you out through that. 
It's part of who God's uh, character has always been. It, you may not know this part of the Bible real well, but there's this book called Leviticus. We went through it like verse by verse a few years ago and it took a long time. But that book is about all the laws that God put in place for his people to learn how to live with each other and with him. And there's this beautiful spot and one, it really shows God's character. In Leviticus 19, he says to all the people who own farms, okay, whatever they're harvesting, apples or grapes or olives, whatever. He says, if you are a farm owner, here's what you're going to do. When you go out to harvest, when you go out to gather your profit, all of the trees, all of the area in the corners of your property, you're going to leave unharvested. I don't want you to take all the stuff off of that. And in fact, while you're gathering it up, when you're bringing it back, if someone drops on the ground, you don't turn around and pick it up. You leave that for the poor. Built into God's way of doing life is the idea of margin for those who need it. It's called gleaning. What God was saying from the beginning is don't maximize your profit. And then on top of that, he tells the people to take a day off a week. Take a Sabbath. Have you ever thought about, I mean, whatever you think about Chick-fil-A and some of their stuff, like how is it that a fast food restaurant takes one day less than everybody else in their business and still manages to outpace their competitors? Like I, that just, that's the principle that God is talking about. You put me first. And, and this message is now sponsored by Chick-fil-A, but I, I didn't mean that. But what I'm saying is there's something at work there that shows us when we make God's kingdom priority, he takes care of us, right? And I would say this to you, because I know some of you right now are like, I don't care what you say. I'm not doing this. It, it's on me. And I would just say, you know what? Look at your life and tell me how it's working. I got to consider your ways. Maybe you don't even buy this whole Jesus thing. If you don't, I would say try his way of life and see if it's not better. We'll work together on what it means to, to come down. But, but he's telling us as the author of life, this is the way your life will go best if you put me first. This um, idea of seeking first the kingdom of God it reminds me of this phrase that I heard, and I think it's really helpful for us. God takes total responsibility for the life that is totally surrendered to him. Both now and forever. God stands ready to take total responsibility for the life that is totally surrendered to him. So how do we do this? Over the next four weeks... We're going to talk about specific and tangible ways to build margin so that you can prioritize God first in your time, in your resources, in your relationships, your emotional and physical health. Because I believe that as we together journey into this, as we begin to do what Jesus asked, to put him first, we will see things happen in us and around us that we never expected. But it's going to start with intentionality. Here's the first step. First thing that you got to do. Jesus said this all the time. Come to me. Like the most often used invitation to follow Jesus was him just saying, come to me. And you remember this verse? He says this in uh, Matthew 11. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first step that we all need to take is to simply come to him with our already overworked, overscheduled, burned out life and just say, Jesus, give me rest. It's, it's us moving towards him first. And you know, here's a tough truth you're as close to God right now as you want to be. Your relationship with God is as healthy and as intimate as you want it to be. James 4, 8 says, if we come close to God, he comes close to us. He's not moving, except that he's moving towards you. So prioritize this week, making space and coming to him. 
And then here's the second thing that he says to do. Step one is uh, come to him. Step two is follow him. And I love this verse. It's in Romans 12. It talks about what this could look like. And it's kind of general, so I'm going to make you or have you apply it here in just a minute on your own. But the general way that Paul talks about how to follow Jesus is this. He says in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to, sur- uh, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, if you think about those words for one second, something's going to jump out at you. Paul says, give him your physical life, and that becomes a spiritual act of worship. Give him your everyday walking around, your your going to the store, the way you parent your kids, how you use your body, how you use your money, what you do with your sleep, all that. Give that to God, your physical life, and that becomes a spiritual act of worship. Isn't that kind of odd? Because you know what happens with a, a physical sacrifice? You know what we do? If you picture that, you, you take a lamb or a goat or something, and after you've like loved it and petted it, whatever, you kill it. And then you put it on an altar and you surrender it and you say it's yours. That's what he's asking us to do with our physical selves. Take everything that's in your life this week and offer it to God. And he says it becomes a spiritual thing. See, part of the issue that we have is we've tried to separate physical from spiritual. We've acted as if those two things aren't real. So, okay, God, you take care of the spiritual side. I got the physical part. And and if I have space left, I'll I'll, I'll clue you in. I'll kind of squeeze you in my schedule. And he's like, no, everything's spiritual. And we know this is true because of something that happened 2,000 years ago on a cross. Where Jesus, the physical man, the, the human, allowed himself to be captured, betrayed, beaten, ripped apart, murdered. And that physical murder became a spiritual atonement. Everything is spiritual. So don't walk away from here today thinking that what we're saying is somehow pile on a whole bunch of other spiritual activities. I'm not. I'm saying begin to view every part of your life as a spiritual activity and begin to allow God to say, I want you to use it like this. I want you to use your early morning time this way. Maybe it's getting up early and journaling and reading. Maybe it's spending a little time serving your your spouse. Maybe it's taking care of your kids and doing that later in the day. I don't know. All I know is that he asks us to simply lay it down on an altar and say, do with it what you want. Isn't that cool? And then he says, if you'll do that, I'll take care of the rest. You don't have to be anxious about a thing. Could you imagine going through life that way? Can you imagine if, let's say February, five months from now, you woke up one morning, you're having coffee and you're talking to a friend and you're like, I haven't been anxious for like five months. I haven't experienced worry at all. What's changed? You get a new job? Nope. You get a raise? Nope. Did you finally start dating her? Nope. I don't know. I just haven't been anxious. What if we took Jesus at his word and we completely surrendered our lives to him and we found that he was honest, that there's a better way for us to live? That's the challenge. It's up to you. But you got four weeks to let us equip you with some tools that maybe, maybe, could change the way your life is experienced for the rest of your life. And that leaves a legacy for your kids who are watching us, who are learning from us, and allows them to make different choices in the future than we did. So here's the way I want to end. I want to give you one big idea to consider this week, and then I want to give you one practical step to put in place every single day. Seven days. Here's the big idea. The big idea is that when you make God's kingdom your priority, you always have enough. All right, our, our goal this week is to get that ingrained and to actually believe it. If we don't believe it yet, it's to let our minds marinate on it and to turn it around and to look at it and to see, begin to, to find out and investigate if that could be true. That if we make God's kingdom our priority, we will always have more than enough. That's the big idea, the, the, the ask, the action step is this. I want you to start each day this week with praying a prayer of surrender to God. That sounds kind of like that Romans 12 one. God, today I give you, and you could go through your calendar if you want. 
Here's the appointments I have, God, I give them to you. What do you want me to say? I know I need to close the deal, but is there something that you want me to see and speak to that person on the other side of the table? I know here, here's my, my money this week. Here's my, whatever it is, all your life, just pray a prayer of surrender and see if God doesn't show you places he wants you to act in. What do you think? Do you think we can do this? Seven days, one prayer, and God may blow our minds. He might begin this week. That anxiety that you walked in here with, you might be able to walk out and actually not feel it again for a few days. Because when we make him first, he says he promises to take care of us. So I'm gonna give you a minute right now. If something stuck out to you, if there is something that you thought of that you need to surrender or that you need capacity, I want you to use your outline, your handout, and just write it down right now. Take a moment and respond with your pen to what God might be saying in your heart. And then I'm gonna close this in prayer. God, while we are um, scratching ink on paper in a physical act of making a note, you might be doing something spiritual in us. While people are choosing to prioritize you in some way, maybe it's small, maybe it's big, but it's different than what they did before this morning, we're asking you to show up. Jesus, We want to believe, and I think that every person in here wants to believe that what you say is true. That when we seek you first, that we don't have to be anxious about anything else. So I'm gonna ask you, God, this feels bold, but I wanna ask you that in these hearts and lives in this room this week, that you would do exactly that. That we would tangibly feel a difference in our anxiety level because we began to surrender to you. I pray that you would meet needs in supernatural ways and miraculous ways. And I pray you'd meet them through physical ways of each of us in the community of faith. I pray that we would somehow begin to learn what it means to live a life full of margin and space to respond when you call. And I pray that this week in seven days, you would do something and begin birthing something different for us that lets us be a family, a church that has an inordinate impact on our city because we prioritized you. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for your sacrifice that makes this possible. Thank you that you didn't allow the spiritual and the physical, the sacred and the secular to stay separated, but you chose to bridge them with yourself. And because of that, we have enough. We love you. And it's in your resurrected name we pray.